Good evening. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. The United Nations Security Council voted unanimously on Saturday in favor of a 30-day ceasefire in Syria. The United Nations Security Council voted unanimously on Saturday in favor of a 30-day ceasefire in Syria. The decision came after severe reports of civilian casualties. The resolution called for all parties to cease hostilities without delay across the country to enable the safe, unimpeded and sustained delivery of humanitarian aid and services and medical evacuations of the critically sick and wounded. The resolution comes during a period where Turkey is engaged in a military operation in the Syrian province of Afrin. Following the voting of the resolution, the White House called for an immediate end to offensive operations in Syria. The White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders told the reporters that Syria is terrorizing hundreds of thousands of civilians with airstrikes, artillery, rockets and a looming ground attack. Similarly, French President Emmanuel Macron told his Turkish counterpart Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Monday that the latest UN ceasefire vote applied to all Syrian territory, including the province of Afrin. Turkey forcefully rejected all Western calls to suspend its offensive in Afrin. Ankara argued that the UN resolution does not apply to its military operation in Afrin against the YPG militia. Speaking to reporters in Ankara, Deputy Prime Minister Bekir Bozdağ said, Afrin is not mentioned in the UN resolution. Terrorists are all the same. You cannot divide them into bad and good ones. The United States behaves illogically guided by double standards. This cannot be accepted. Despite passing the resolution, the UN Security Council was told that no immediate action was taken by the actors. The UN humanitarian chief Mark Lowcock repeatedly told the reporter that the resolution had not been implemented. Meanwhile, despite having de-escalated after the resolution call, Turkey's Afrin operation is continuing. The International Committee of the Red Cross said a humanitarian aid convoy entered the Afrin region on Thursday, for the first time since the start of the operation. During the clashes on Thursday, it has been announced by military sources that eight soldiers were killed and 13 more were wounded. At least 40 Turkish soldiers and 2,295 YPG militants have reportedly been killed since the beginning of the operation. Turkey had launched the operation on January 20th alongside elements of the Free Syrian Army to clear YPG militants from Afrin. Joining us via Skype tonight is Semih Idis, who is a columnist for Hurriyet Daily News, and he'll answer our questions on the UN Security Council's resolution calling for ceasefire in Syria and Turkey's ongoing military operation in Afrin. Good evening, Mr. Idis. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Good evening. So let's start with an easy question. What's the meaning of this uh, ceasefire resolution? How do you make sense of it? Well, uh, uh, technically speaking, it's meant to prevent the bloodshed in eastern Ghouta and Idlib uh, and allow for humanitarian access for the wounded uh, and, and those who are besieged there. Uh, but of course, as we know, uh, in the lead up to the adoption of the resolution, there was a lot of politics also involved. Uh, so it's not clear what the true aim is uh, of the resolution, but uh, it has nevertheless uh, been a hard, uh, a hard adopted resolution after a very tough compromise between Russia and uh, the rest of the Security Council. Uh, and I think it has more political significance than much significance on the ground, because as we can see, the situation on the ground hasn't improved much yet. So Ankara has said uh, the ceasefire resolution of the UN Security Council does not apply to its ongoing military operation in Afrin against the Kurdish YPG militia and the US, France and Germany uh, most recently have all separately called on Turkey to implement the ceasefire. Do you think these calls are likely to continue for Turkey to end its military operation in Afrin, and could these calls perhaps turn into greater pressure? Well, uh, I don't think the calls will change anything, uh, because we have statements from the official side in Ankara. Uh, uh, we have ministers who have said that the operation continue, uh, and the Deputy Prime Minister, Baker Bozda, has said that this resolution does not cover the Turkish operation. And regardless of what others are saying at the moment, Turkey 
uh, insists that it will continue with its operation. So as you've said, Turkey is currently insisting that it will go on with its operation, but uh, let's, let's assess the chances of Turkey uh, stepping back in the near future, perhaps. Is this ceasefire, in your opinion, likely to change Turkey's position at all on the ground uh, in Afrin? In other words, is Turkey likely to step back? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think Turkey feels it has a certain momentum in Afrin at the moment. And don't forget that this ceasefire is only valid for the month. It has to be extended after that by the UN. Uh, so there isn't much time left there. Uh, and it's very unlikely that Turkey will want to stop the momentum it has gained. Uh, and it has introduced new forces into Afrin now, so it is preparing uh, for the uh, battle against the YPG in Afrin city. Uh, I think plans are too far gone for Turkey to be able to pull back at this moment. And finally, let's um, end by, uh, by talking a bit about uh, the current dynamics in the already strained relations between U.S. and Turkey. How do you evaluate this uh, recent ceasefire-related war of words uh, between the U.S. Department of State spokesperson Heather Nowert and a number of Turkish government officials, including uh, Minister Bekir Bozda. How do you evaluate this quarrel, um, so to speak, in terms of uh, U.S., in terms of the recent nature of, of U.S.-Turkey relations? Is tension mounting once again between Ankara and Washington? Well, uh, I think it goes to show how sensitive the situation is, despite uh, the visit by uh, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson to Turkey. You know, during that visit, the sides decided to establish mechanisms to reduce tensions. Uh, but these exchanges that we saw now over Afrin and Resolution 2401 show that the sides are still continue to be sensitive about each other's position in Syria. And there is always the, the uh, possibility, of course, that tensions will increase in the coming period. Uh, but uh, we also saw during uh, Tillerson's visit that both sides also want to try and find some kind of a settlement. They don't want to head uh, or go headlong into a confrontation. Uh, but at the moment, they are quite apart on many issues in Syria. And because of that, the sensitivity on both sides still continues. Thank you very much, Mr. Idris, for joining us tonight. Thank you. After being detained in Prague last week, former PYD co-chair Salih Muslim was released by a Czech court on Tuesday. A Czech court ruled on Tuesday to release former PYD co-chair Salih Muslim, who was detained in Prague on February 25th, despite Turkey's request of extradition. The hearing was held behind closed doors and the court officials did not make any comments on the hearing. Deputy Prime Minister and government spokesperson Bekir Bozda slammed the Czech court's ruling to release Muslim, saying that it proves European Union state's support for terrorism. This decision very clearly amounts to support for terrorism, but it came as no surprise for Turkey, because the EU member countries' stance on Turkey and on the people who have carried out terrorist acts against Turkey are obvious, Bozda told reporters. He also added that the ruling is against international law and it will have a negative impact on Turkish-Czech relations. The Turkish Foreign Ministry also blasted the Czech court's release decision, saying that with its ruling, the court did not act in accordance with the Czech jurisdiction's responsibilities arising from international law and the fight against terrorism. The PYD is a Syrian offshoot of the PKK that is listed as a terrorist organization by the EU and thus the Czech Republic as a member of the EU. With this decision, the Czech Republic gives a new example of that the rhetoric on the fight against terrorism in Europe was insincere and hardly believable, the ministry said in a statement. Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu said Turkey issued a diplomatic note to the Czech Republic for the release of Muslim, adding that Turkey will pursue Muslim wherever he goes. Muslim was detained by the Czech police on February 24th at the request of the Turkish Interpol. Turkey accuses him of attempting to disrupt the unity and territorial integrity of the state through a series of terror attacks on Turkish soil that claimed the lives of scores of civilians.
Until two years ago, Muslim had liaised with Ankara several times on diplomatic issues related to Syria. But since then, he has been put on the Turkish Interior Ministry's most wanted terrorist list with a million dollar bounty on his head. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe warned Turkey this week that the new draft law on Internet-based media services could restrict online broadcasting. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, warned Turkey that a new draft law regarding Internet-based media services could restrict online broadcasting and further limit media pluralism in the country. In a letter sent to the Minister of Foreign Affairs Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu and Minister of Justice Abdülhamit Gül, the OSCE representative on freedom of the media, Harlem Desir, shared a legal review on the draft law and stated that it's also questionable whether the law is compatible with international treaties. The proposed regulation would allow the government watchdog radio and television Supreme Council to hold audio and video material streamed online, social media posts and streaming platforms such as Netflix if they are deemed a threat to national security or moral values. Opposition parties CHP and HDP have both criticized the proposed expansion of the watchdog's powers. The Committee to Protect Journalists has also called on Turkish authorities to scrap the regulation that would expand internet censorship in Turkey. According to human rights lawyer Kerem Altıparmak, if passed, the regulation will grant the Supreme Council the ability to issue or reject broadcasting licenses without providing a reason, giving it full power over who can publish content. Since the 2016 coup attempt, authorities in Turkey have closed down more than 150 media outlets. Monitoring groups have also accused Turkey of blocking access to social media sites. Last year, Turkey's telecommunications watchdog announced that access to online encyclopedia Wikipedia had been blocked, citing a law allowing it to ban access to websites that may be a threat to national security. Scenes showing alcohol and cigarette consumption are blurred out in most television broadcasts and scenes involving physical intimacy are often cut out from cable and premium programming. Prime Minister Binali Yildirim announced on Tuesday that the government will not step back in the privatization process of 14 sugar factories around the country. Turkey's Prime Minister Binali Yildirim announced on Tuesday that the ruling Justice and Development Party AKP government will not step back in the privatization process of 14 sugar factories around the country. According to a notice released in the official gazette, bids will be collected for sugar plants in the central Anatolian provinces and towns of Bor, Çorum, Kırşehir and Yozgat until April 3rd, and in the eastern and Black Sea provinces and towns of Erzincan, Erzurum, Ilgın, Kastamonu and Turhal until April 11th. The authority has set April 18th as a date to collect bids for sugar plants in other areas. The move drew considerable criticism, with the Sugar Work Union appealing to the Council of State for a stay of execution of the bids by the Privatization Board of Turkey OIB, and filing a criminal complaint against the OIB authorities for malpractice. Main opposition Republican People's Party CHP leader Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu also slammed the bid to privatize sugar plants, saying the move aims to promote starch-based sugar production and would affect nearly a million citizens. Sugar factories are part of our history. They were the first factories built in the Republic of Turkey. It is our duty to revive and modernize those plants. Turkey has come to a point where it is now having to buy sugar when it used to sell it, Kılıçdaroğlu said on Tuesday, addressing the CHP parliamentary group. The CHP head suggested that the government's move is related to U.S. food corporation Cargill's investments in Turkey. They are doing this to clear the way for the starch-based sugar production. They gave promises to the former president of the United States for Cargill to establish here in Turkey, Kılıçdaroğlu said. Union of Turkish Chambers of Agriculture head Şemsi Bayraktar said the privatization move would badly hit sugar beet producers. Sugar is a strategically important product, so the plan to privatize 14 state-run sugar factories should be considered thoroughly, Bayraktar said in a press conference in Ankara on Thursday, adding that these factories buy sugar beet from farmers in more than 1,500 villages and towns across Turkey. While around 2 million tons of sugar is produced annually in Turkey, nearly 2.1 million tons of sugar is consumed, Bayraktar said, adding that this demand should be met by local sources in an effort to maintain independence from foreign sources in this key product.
12 schools previously linked to the Fethullahist terrorist organization, FETO, were taken over by the Turkish Marif Foundation in Afghanistan on Monday. 12 schools and three tuition centers, which were previously linked to the Fethullahist terrorist organization FETÖ, were taken over by the Turkish Marif Foundation in Afghanistan on Monday. The Marif Foundation is a state-run educational charity organization. Education Minister Ismet Yilmaz and his Afghan counterpart Mohammed Ibrahim Shinwari attended the handover ceremony at the Media and Information Center in the capital city of Kabul on February 26, state-run Anadolu Agency has reported. We would like, especially in the area of education, to develop our cooperation with Afghanistan. The joy of the Afghan people is our joy, and their pain is ours. We will not allow anyone to damage and poison our eternal friendship, Yilmaz said, adding that Turkey wished for the stability of Afghanistan more than any other country in the world. Meanwhile, during his visit to Senegal as a part of a four-country tour of Africa, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said on Thursday that it's important to shut down the FETO-linked schools in Africa. Our cooperation with Senegal in combating FETO is to continue. Shutting down of FETO-linked schools is very, very important, Erdogan said. We will raise a generation which is fond on its motherland, which works for the country and their family, through schools being established in Senegal via our Mari Foundation, he added. The Mari Foundation was established in 2016 to take over the administration of overseas schools linked to the FETO. It also establishes schools and education centers abroad. The Turkish government deems the FETÖ as the main orchestrator of the failed coup of July 2016, which left 250 people dead and nearly 2,200 injured. Erdogan's tour of Africa started on February 26th with a visit to Algeria, followed by Mauritania. His last stop will be Mali. Now we'll take a look at what's on in Istanbul next week. Acid Pauli will be on the decks tonight at Mini Music Hall at the hip district of Jihangir at the heart of Beyoğlu. The 200 tickets that were on sale were immediately sold out. Acid Pauli will be followed by Tutan and Başekim. Martin Gretschmann, the name behind Acid Pauli, is also known for his projects Console and The Notwist and has been in the music industry for over 20 years. He has been one of the residents of Burning Man and Fusion Festival, performing together with trendsetting DJs Koze and Jamie XX. This evening, we will be dancing to his unique production at Mini Music Hall at the heart of Beyoğlu, the hip district Jihangir. On Saturday evening, Babylon Bomonti is hosting Chinese Man for a Record Party. The Marcellian trio Haiku, Sly and Zé Mateo's project Chinese Man takes inspiration from Zen philosophy. Their first album, Groove Sessions, drew a lot of attention in 2007, featuring the song I've Got That Tune. The group mixes reggae, funk and old-school hip-hop with turntable shows. They use similar tunes including Turkish and Oriental sounds with their own twist. Together with Youth Star and ASM, they will bring their peaceful and energetic vibes to Babylon Bamanti tomorrow evening. The Pill will be introducing Rafael Barantoni with his first solo show in Turkey, Tape Street from an Asteroid. He brings about a spiritual odyssey into the historical and the futuristic, with an installation of large-scale textile collages and a new body of paintings. The textile collages are reminiscent of history-themed wall tapestry, and the paintings carry into gallery the fantastic sounds and images from the whole world. The exhibition has been on since 24th of January, and will be running at the pill until the end of March. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again next Friday at 9 p.m. Goodbye.